Hi guys, this is Fernando doing another video for the Mars Survivalist. In this case, it's going to be a video about the importance of air. Breathable, nice, fresh air that is so often taken for granted. If you have been involved in survival and preparedness for some time, you've probably came across something called the rule of three. Basically, the rule of three says that you cannot survive three minutes without air, you cannot survive three hours of exposure to extreme temperatures without proper protection. You cannot survive three days without water. And you cannot survive for three weeks without food. Right? Now, we often understand that you need water, you need food. Sometimes water is, is overlooked a bit, in my opinion. That's just my estimation. And it's, we take it for granted that you always have the faucet. You twist it and there you go. But uh, air... I mean, how, how often is it that we take it for granted all the time? Do you have one of these or one of these? Probably not. And the respirator, the one that you see here, this one is, this is a S10 MBC respirator, nuclear, biological and chemical respirator. And I'm going to be doing a review on this sort of stuff later. But uh, before any of that, I wanted to do a proper introduction to a subject because when you see something like this, you see the, the respirator, sometimes referred as the, the, the face mask, which, well, it's actually a respirator, but um, usually has a negative connotation, and understandably so up to a point. Usually when you think of, of crazy survivalist guys preparing always for the end of the world or the, you know, the, the, the fallout scenario, nuclear warfare and that sort of stuff, this comes, comes into place. But... Um, as I made reference in some of my previous videos, especially if you haven't seen those before, I suggest doing so. The one on one is called preparedness getting started, and the other one is called preparedness versus paranoia. Right, trying to bring a bit of um, level-headed common sense into all this stuff. And one of the things that I mentioned in those videos was that you have to ask yourself a question: Has something like that happened before? Right. That's one of the, of the basic important questions that you should often make to yourself. You should ask yourself, has this ever happened before? Have I ever had a need for food? Of course, you have need for food every single day. Same with water. What about air? You have, as a rule of three clearly dictates, you're constantly breathing and you're constantly needing air. And is a, it's of extreme importance, more important than anything else. Okay, you're not going to be living very long if you don't have air. So, when have you actually needed air and not have it? Well, maybe that's not that common. When have you needed proper air and instead ended up with not so good air? And that's where <laughs> things start getting a bit more interesting. I, if I ask myself that question, if I think of my own, you know, that's a, an exercise we can all do in, in your own experience in your own perspective which might as well be very different from mine depending on where you are how old you are how long you've lived how long you've been in this world and such um, you may have more or less experience and more or less uh, incidents having gone through and, and that sort of thing it's entirely possible if I look at my own life in, in rather recent years and I, I take a look at that I, well, I remember vividly a few incidents, and then I went online and started looking um, for more exact information, because all that stuff, you, you eventually forget. You forget when things uh, happen, how long they happened, so it was a, a nice little exercise to go back to. And not much of a big surprise, I found these different uh, incidents. One, two, three, four in the, in the last few years, okay? And I remember many of them quite vividly, right? Let's start chronologically speaking. April 2008, the <laughs> Great Argentine Smokeout. That's a, a name given by the Time magazine in USA. So it was, it went beyond the borders of, of Argentina. It was clearly noticed by, by other agencies around the world as well. What basically happened was that there was 500 different grass fires in the vicinity of the city of Buenos Aires. It was, some say it was the, the farmers burning up grass so as to uh, liberate land for, for cattle. Others say that it was because of political problems between the farmers and the government. And there's also the suggestion that it was 
it, it, it was started by the government itself so as to create animosity towards farmers. At those times, they were, they were trying to get a new tax uh, raised against farmers, which was pretty pretty hard one it was um, a very steep tax it was basically taking like 80 percent of what they got from from their work so there was this real pro uh, political problem going on the little people <laughs> we ended up suffering it uh, by this because of these fires uh, one person or another um, one group or another did start these fires and one day we woke up and man the city was covered in smoke First thing you see, you, you think is well, it's it's uh, you know it's uh, it's, uh, it's not smog. You think it's like uh, you know harmless typical fog that you may be used to or you have seen some time or, an or another. Fog, well, you you see that and you say yeah, it's fog. Then you go outside and you actually breathe in, <laughs> and it's not fog. It's smoke. And it's very acrid. The the smoke by fires of, of grass fires and such. It's very acrid. It's very say a bit nauseating. It's awful actually. And we ended up with this cloud of a cloud of smoke in the city of Buenos Aires almost for a month. It was very bad, especially for people that have respiratory problems, uh, in s uh, small kids, older, older uh, people. Uh, again, something that I didn't mention, made reference to before. The, the groups are more vulnerable, the, the senior citizens, the older guys or the very young ones, uh, or the ones with um, pre-existing conditions, those are generally more vulnerable. But even for someone like myself, I mean it was um, late 20s back then I suppose, um, yeah, <laughs> it was also pretty bad. I remember going uh, to, to work and the, the subways, those tunnels, they were also full with smoke. And it got into your, of course, into your, your, your nose, your lungs, your eyes as well, got irritated by the smoke. And there was nothing you could do because it got into everything. You tried to uh, close the windows, it was suggested on TV to use uh, like um, uh, cloths were wet and put those uh, so as to seal windows as well as as good as possible uh, and it's funny the way uh, the government often reacts to this one of the first things that they came out saying was that this is completely harmless <laughs> and you just wondered uh, how could it be harmless to be breathing in all this junk that irritates my 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 face my eyes are all, you know, constantly tearing and such uh, how how could it be possible that this isn't bad for me? Uh, sometime later, it, w it was said that it was like passive smoking. Uh, that, but it wasn't bad for you because it was all organic stuff being burned. Uh, yet the smoke was there and the irritation was there for all of us. Uh, some people needed medical attention. Uh, some managed worse than others. But it was it was a problem. I came very close to buying, um, making a, a pretty steep investment, buying a, a filtering system for my home. But um, you know, it was quite a bit of money, and after a few weeks more, it, it stopped. You know, it's one of those things that you say, when is it, is this gonna be stopping? I mean, 500 different fires spread over, it burned over uh, 300 square miles in the borders of Buenos Aires. Uh, yeah, a month, a month living in smoke, awful. You, you just you, you just don't get a break because it's bad uh, on the streets and when you get home you say okay here I'm gonna be relaxing a little bit but no you're sitting in your living room and you see the cloud inside your living room <laughs> it's <laughs> it's pretty awful and you don't get a break uh, thinking a bit more I mean, when, when getting a shower for example that was the only time when because of the the dampness and the, the water uh, kind of you know pouring on you that was the only time when you actually got a break when you, you had this, the, the shower in your face and that was when when you got a a, a break of, of clean air but it's a very long time a month living like that <laughs> I don't want to be going through that again um, I don't wish it on anyone uh, and surprisingly enough and again you, you know you think about how you take it for granted and during th this period in 2008 I suppose most of uh, Argentines uh, especially those of us living in Buenos Aires we understood that air was something we had been taking for granted you know soon enough we had <laughs> the the problem of a volcano erupting in in the in the Andes 
but because of the wind, it was taking all that ash plum. If you see the, the satellite photos, it's quite impressive. It's like a little spot that spreads all over the continent. And bad enough luck that the wind was taking it towards Buenos Aires. Now, that's, um, that's uh, yeah, that's bad as well. doesn't smell as bad as grass. But uh, it, it's, uh, you feel like these little pieces of glass going into your nose. It's pretty bad as well. I think it's even worse than, uh, than grass smoke, than, than grass being burned or, or wood or wildfires. Uh, it's because it has this uh, uh, silly dust, like, like uh, crystal dust, like glass. It's like this uh, crushed glass and you're breathing that in and I remember that the first morning uh, we already knew that the wind was taking it our, our way because of you know the, the news was saying so and we knew that next morning we would see this but it's pretty impressive to wake up one day and see everything covered with a layer of of, of ash of volcanic ash and this uh, still is dust it's the, like this Crisp, like this glass, you just touch it and it feels like glass as well. And it's you know, it's coming from a volcano, so it makes sense. And this is it, it's clearly worse for you than, than just the grass stuff, the grass smoke. Yeah, actually, it's the longest word, uh, word in English uh, dictionary. The word for, for the disease this could bring to you it's pneumo ultra microscopic silico volcanic. Coniosis. <laughs> if you look that up, that's actual the word for it. It's uh, basically silicosis, which is similar to the miner's lung, right? It affects your your lungs when exposed to this long term. I suppose that for the period of time we're exposed to, you also have some consequences. And again, children, older folks, those are the ones that are more, uh, more in more delicate conditions. But um, yeah, again, bad. And as the same thing as, as when we had the, the, the grass fires, these things, the respirators and the face mask, all this stuff, it was selling on the street for five, ten times more than the price going for before. And this is the one that I had with me. Well, this is, I had a couple of these. These were pretty expensive. This one is in, a, in another bag. As you see, it's in a Ziploc bag because uh, I would carry this all the time in my in my EDC bag. After this event, I understood that it was something that I should I should be keeping in mind. And carrying it so much, the the little bag that it came with started uh, tearing up and breaking. So I got one of these so as to preserve it a bit better. And you know, usually these aren't that expensive. And I'm gonna be doing videos explaining a, a little bit better about uh, this stuff, the respirators or, or the, the proper ones, the the NBC stuff as well. Um, I'm gonna be doing videos on that. But this is was ba this is basically an introduction to the the topic. All right. And well, we had this volcano erupting on us, <laughs> which was pretty interesting. Um, also some of the things when you try to remove it from from your uh, windshield from your car it's uh, it sticks and water just makes it worse I don't know why that is it's better if you just blow it or you know uh, push it with with something rather than just uh, use water if you're using water you better have lots of it because it's not easy to get off your your car and you just keep thinking what is this doing in my lungs <laughs> it can't be good it also contaminates water sources closer to where the volcano was erupting there was like a couple of feet worth of, of this stuff on the ground and there's some, some impressive footage of how it contaminated some of these beautiful pristine uh, patagonic lakes you know, with, with like a, a thick layer of this stuff covering the lakes entirely. Uh, and the animals, especially in the sheep, it would just make extra weight in their, in their fur coat. And also when they would eat the grass, they would eat along the grass with these ashes. And because of this molded uh, glass kind of thing in this ash, it would, uh, it would um, literally grind through their teeth. So it destroyed their teeth as well and caused, uh, of course, in intestinal problems. And it was a, a serious uh, economic impact, especially in the tourist area. Think about it in, in the, the southern Patagonia of Argentina. It's beautiful land, all these lakes and forests and all this stuff. 
but uh, with this uh, volcanic ash, I mean, man, you couldn't even get a flight getting you getting you there. And you know, tourism pretty much stopped. And again, it's one of those things that you think, well, I'm living in the southern uh, hemisphere of the South American. I'm, I'm living in South. South America. <laughs> I'm further away from the civilization than I could possibly be, and just a, a volcano goes up on you and and causes you all these troubles. So it affects you no matter what. You may be in the most beautiful natural place on the planet, which might as well be, and the volcano erupts, and you have the need for this, right? It wasn't because of fallout, but it's because of natural causes, right? And just look, 2008, 2008, same year two different causes, man-made, natural, and you were still having the problem of your uh, air source being affected, your, your safe, clean, breathe, uh, breathable air being affected and being compromised to, to some degree. Sooner enough, June 2009, the swine flu pandemic. And that was a huge mess, especially in Argentina. What happened was typical of, uh, of the new, well, not new by now, already kind of old, K government, the K government, as it's called in Argentina. And the K government has this uh, policy of denying everything. <laughs> so, you know, inflation, no, we have no inflation in Argentina. Crime, no, there's no, really no crime. It's a sensation of crime, but it's really not a, not a crime. When swine flu came as well, it wasn't, it wasn't really a problem. It was, it was all this stuff made up by gringos and Americans that they, you know, they, spread, they spread paranoia, but there was no problem with swine flu. So the way the government in Argentina dealt with swine flu was ignoring it completely. And that was a very bad call. It actually cost lots of people their lives that could have been sp uh, spared if they had done things properly. So basically the threat was completely ignored, lack of public awareness campaign, and this is the key. They didn't tell people to wash their hands, they didn't tell people to cover their noses when sneezing, they didn't tell people all this stuff that many of us know already, right? But there's lots of people that don't. And if it's not drilled in their brains through campaign and television and ads, they don't do this stuff. They don't wash their hands. They don't, uh, they're not aware of, of the surfaces they're touching all the time, constantly, uh, on, tr on public transportation, on, uh, when, when you press the buttons on, on elevators, in the office, when you touch the handles of doors. Every single thing you, you touch is a potential way of, of getting the, the disease. And since none of this was done, especially in a place where we're talking about 2009, almost a, a decade after the economic collapse, all right? Uh, think of much worse uh, hygiene conditions in general. Think of more poverty in general. All that poverty caused because of the economic collapse had already had a, a consequence uh, on the population. We're talking about more poverty, more, more diseases spread in general. This, the social degradation in 2009 is quite evident. If you go back and compare it to what was life in 2000, it's the, the difference is quite clear. And with the swine flu going on, being completely ignored, it was, it was bad. All right. I don't like making reference to many of these numbers because I know that in many cases they are they are not, uh, they don't express well the truth, especially in Argentina where numbers are just cooked up depending on what they like doing. This is, uh, I think this was, I got it from an, in, an international agency, some health agency of some sort, and basically says death rate in Argentina was 16.3 per thousand, right? It was a country where more people died. Than, than any other. In, in USA, which, which is the country where more people died uh, because of swine flu, uh, per thousand per thousand people infected in USA, 3.1 died. In Mexico, all right, uh, for every thousand people that got infected with, with swine flu, 14.1, right? In Argentina, 16.3. And, I mean, numbers, just numbers, but if I'm thinking of my own experience during these times, during the June 2009 swine flu, yeah, I remember that uh, it, was, it was bad, honestly. Um, in, in my kid's school, my son's school, two, two people died. One of them was a kid. 
and th there was this I think this lady she was she, I don't know if she was a teacher or a, or a cook in the school <laughs> which was you know when 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 that was said you know the cook died of swine flu in your kid's school they, ah, it gives you the creeps but um, and we didn't have the culture like for example in, in Japan the Japanese guys they give you these you, you see people wearing these all the time all right uh, you sneeze and it's like a, a matter of good manners someone offers you just like they offer you a napkin they offer you a, a, a face mask so as to cover your face difference between face mask and respirators guys I don't want to get into all this stuff right now but the, the face mask is basically a piece of cloth that what's basically doing is preventing you from spreading the disease it's not really protecting you much uh, this is giving you a bit more protection because it has a better coverage of your face it has a valve so the, because of the valve you're not you're not protecting from from uh, you're not protecting from spreading the disease yourself as you would with a proper uh, face mask right but uh, we didn't have that culture yet you would see lots of people starting wearing these uh, i remember that i had this because of what had happened before i had one of these in my in in my bag in my everyday carry bag and I was I went to the university and in the door there was this sign that was <laughs> this is the stuff you, you just cannot make up you it's incredible in, in the front door of the University of Buenos Aires in Ciudad Universitaria those of you do, who know the place there was this huge sign and you probably read that if you were studying there at the moment there was this huge sign that said uh, we cannot offer the proper conditions uh, for your for your own health um, so basically come in at your own risk <laughs> something it was it was like a longer explanation but basically they were saying that that they could not the university of buenos aires cannot guarantee the proper health conditions for for the the students and the teacher and the personnel so you were being advised of what was going on in the situation just walking at your own risk and I had this mask and I said okay what the hell I put it on and I went inside and I, I, I was one of the very few in there that had one of these I suppose that others had been I don't know why they were wearing one or not but it was maybe two or three of us with masks and the rest of them just look at you like kind of weird now when someone started coughing <laughs> everyone <laughs> you you would notice that they started covering their face June, remember winter in south southern hemisphere they would start covering their faces with scarves you know trying to you know improvise what what you had for real trying to improvise it some way covering their faces with scarves and, and it, it was funny because you would see people you know someone would would cough loudly and he, he probably had <laughs> swine flu because it was the most pro predominant flu uh, during that time uh, it was uh, of the people that got it it was uh, it was very strong my son he, he got it himself uh, it was a very bad flu you know what's the difference between swine flu and normal flu well it, it's just a flu just worse but it's it's very hard on, on, on the people that gets it some guys deal with it better uh, others not so much um, but like with any other flu there's a chance of you dying the thing is that this particular flu at least in, in, in my experience what I've seen is that it was pretty bad you see people like spitting their lungs and yeah many of them didn't even cover their faces because of that combination of lack of public awareness campaign and such we, we had a, a very bad uh, June 2009 in terms of, of the pandemic and as if that wasn't enough, <laughs> just a couple of years later, the Puechue volcano <laughs> erupted. Puechue, Puechue er, er, volcano erupted in 2011, from June to October again, all all, all over again with the ash stuff. And again, you would wake up, especially in the mornings. It's usually worse. You just breathe that stuff in, and it's ah oh, man, it's awful. And I don't know. The bad days, you can wear one of these. Uh, that helps yes of course it does but uh, it goes on for months and it's in the air all the time the closer you are to the volcano of course the worse man I do not envy those guys in those little southern uh, uh, Patagonic towns where it was very very bad man that's bad the, the, the layer of ash was was impressive you could go on youtube i suppose and see all that stuff uh, if you if you search all this up and especially how it contaminated the, the water sources and all that but uh, again 
examples of, of how it, it, it could be possible for you needing that. And I'm not even talking about, you know, uh, let's t suppose a, a terrorist attack using a, a dirty bomb where you would be needing indeed one of these, right? So as to avoid a contamination, a, a good respirator that's uh, necessary along with an NBC suit as well. And this, is not, this isn't going to be offering you any protection in those cases. Uh, but then again, you can think of, of fires, of, of exiting buildings that uh, are, are aflame because of a fire. Uh, think of it in terms, uh, if, you, if you think of 9-11 with that huge, when the buildings, when the towers went down, that huge cloud that just swept over people running, they were covering their faces, their eyes as well, uh, all with, with that, uh, that dust, you know, air something that we often take for granted too much and should be addressed. At least understanding, and especially if you look at your own uh, situation, and, and even if you, you're not living close to any volcanic uh, activities, uh, regions and such, I mean, in Buenos Aires there's no earthquakes whatsoever, but the wind brought it in our direction, and that's basically something you cannot do anything about. Even if you live in a, in a good uh, geological location, the wind maybe what, what affects you, what ruins you, what brings all this stuff from thousands of miles away to your, to your home, all right? But air is so important that you should be covering, all right? Don't think of it in terms of, yeah, I'm completely nuts because I have one of these and I'm preparing for the end of the world. Think of it in terms of, I understand that air is so important that I should have something for it. All right, I should have. I went through several of these uh, masks and different things. Um, along the way, learn a thing or two, understand that these work for certain things, but not for others. Uh, ideally, you would have something like this, all right, which offers complete NBC protection. This may be a bit of, of overkill for some people if you just want something to try to avoid the, you know, the, the little spit particles in the air and just uh, avoid touching your face, which is often more than anything else the, the way you, you get a uh, flu because we, we just tend to touch our faces and that's one of the roles of, of the face masks and the respirators. This one in particular, is, is, a, is a good model because it's a collapsible one that just folds very flat as you see here. And I've used uh, different kinds and this with the valve, it really gives you a, a better way of breathing and doesn't fatigue you as much, right? If, if you use the normal ones, the, the normal respirators that just cover everything, you soon feel it, you, your heart rate going up as soon as you're climbing up ladders and stairs and such, uh, walking a bit more around you feel uh, that uh, extra effort so as to taking a breath. But with this, it, it's a bit more simple. It also avoids the mask from getting all uh, moisture and humid because of your, uh, the humidity and your breathing in and out. And when that happens, it also starts affecting the, the performance of, of the respirator. But all stuff that I'm gonna be talking in, a, in another video, guys. For now, starting with understanding that it's important to cover the topic of air. It's, a basic necessity, even worse than water, food, shelter, all that stuff that we often mention. We should mention air as well. Guys, take care. I hope you're liking these videos. As always, consider subscribing. Button somewhere over there. Take care and see you in our next video. Have a good day.